And hello, so uh, my name is Kuba Mościcki. Uh, I've been spamming you for the last two months about <laughs> uploading slides and so on. Um, but besides that, which is organizing the conference, which is also lots of fun, I um, work uh, in the sandbox team in the storage group. And here I would like to share with you a couple of thoughts about how we evolved in the past and how we are going to evolve in the future our architecture. So just a brief recap. So we have a sandbox service in active development and full production since 2014. And essentially we do integrate quite many different components from the open source and we also do quite a lot of in-house development. And we do it in collaboration with the community, so with many of you that, uh, that we've already been meeting for the last uh, three years, also at these workshops, uh, and the Jean community and software developers. We have, yes, we do have our storage developed in-house, which is called EOS, and we do pretty amazing things with it, and you will learn all about it tomorrow from Andreas's presentation. And then we also have uh, collaboration with companies uh, such as OnCloud on implementing certain parts of, the, of our system. So just uh, so this talk is about how we evolved the architecture, and essentially we have that two. Dri I would start with two drivers. So the first driver is user demand and the evolution of functionality, and uh, the driver number two is current and expected service growth. And then I will go through some highlights of the architecture for synchronization and data flow for sharing and integration with other services. So let's start the user demand. You know, it's really a topic without a limit, probably. And uh, um, as, uh, in Sandbox, we have essentially all users at CERN that are using uh, IT infrastructure. This is a very diverse community. And you know, we love our users. We cannot change them. So we have to listen to them. However, what we can do, we can change the software and you can deploy better services or more optimized services or new functionalities. So this is what we can do. So if we look uh, a bit more closely in the variety that we have in the in the user community, we have this administration and management uh, people that use Sandbox, and these are the workflows that we all know and love, you know. Office types of workflows with human-generated files, quite low traffic, how many PowerPoint presentations per second can you produce, okay? We are here busy for three days with 50 very nice uh, PowerPoint or PDF files, okay, just 50, okay? Um, and here, really, but in this particular user base, the user ease of use and functionality is really the key, because a lot of people in this in this in this user base here, they are really non-technical people. Okay. Then we also have uh, the system is used by various on-site services, and I picked one example here for the media team. These are very specific application requirements. And for example, in this particular case, these people handled very, handled very large video files in the, same, in, the, in the order of 30, 50 gigabytes per file. And of course, this immediately, uh, you see this immediately with the system, in your system because you have to start f tuning the timeouts here and there and so on. So you have to, you have to, um, you have to do some special things. Then engineers, we have lots of engineers using Sandbox and this is engineers and kind of general purpose Unix computing if you want. And contrary to the administrative people, you know, it's pretty easy to generate a lot of files on the Unix command line. Okay, it doesn't take, uh, doesn't take so much effort. And actually these people have lots of automatically generated files. And I just, just to illustrate, I picked a, one example, the second top user doing accelerator studies, they have 2.5 million simulation files in Sandbox currently in their home directory. And finally, we have scientists, so we have physicists. And these uh, people uh, store physics data sets and uh, code repositories and also kind of general Unix use. And uh, just to illustrate, the top user of our system is a physicist from a big experiment. He has 7 million files and I'm not quite sure how he got it because it's exceeding the quota. Probably we bumped it up for him. Um, and um, in that includes 2.3 million LHC physics data files. Okay, so this is really kind of usage that really pushes our system and we have to somehow adapt to it. So for the second factor is the growth of the service and here I just pick two metrics. One is the number of users which is the um, which is the yellow line here. And you can see this grows more or less uh, linear in, 
in time. And then here's the size of the size of the storage that we have, so it's kind of still pretty small. Uh, but as you can see here, the, this line is really following an exponential trend. Okay, so this service growth from this is from the past. This is really what also drives the evolution of our architecture. And this is where we really have to think about scaling. So if we just recap a little bit the history, like in 2000, we started this in 2014 with a proof of concept architecture with a LAMP stack. And this has had a lot of success with the users. But in anticipation of this, of this growth here, we also worked on an architecture ba based on the EOS. So this is our storage system. And this is the system that we currently have in production. Okay, this is, um, and, the, and as you can see here, this, the, the users started picking up. The worrying part is from the middle of last year, because as you can see, it goes relatively, sl relatively slow here, then it picks up, and then here you can see that there's another change, trend, uh, change in the trend. Since the quotas we give to people and the number of users is sort of linear, it means that people are using more and more the system and they find new, new kinds of new, new usages of the system. Okay? And so this is, uh, this is also what makes us now at the point of really thinking about further scaling and new functionality. So a couple of architecture highlights. So if we start with synchronization, this is the current architecture that we have in, uh, in Sandbox. So we have the sync clients, which are on cloud sync clients. They speak HTTP web DAF, so they speak files. These, this is redirected to our storage system. And essentially, we have embedded web DAF servers on the storage nodes. So this system directly talks to hundreds of storage nodes that we have. So this case horizontally pretty nicely. The main feature of here from the architecture point of view is that we do not have really a big database because we store the entire synchronization state in the storage. And that was one of the, we had quite many discussions at the time we were deploying the pilot. And this is essentially what we came up with as a, um, as a conclusion that we really want to make sure that we keep the storage, uh, the, the, the synchronization state directly in the storage on the, the namespace servers. Um, why? Because first of all, we do not have to keep another big uh, and rapidly growing namespace in, a, in, a next, in, a, uh, in, a, in another database, and we also avoid having any kind of synchronization problems between the two data sources. Um, okay, so this works uh, in the standard way. So if there is a file modified here, this is I notified to a client, and then uh, the, um, the file is the, fi or the file or the files are put to the storage. Um, likewise, um, on the server, if something changes, then we have this ETAC propagation that we implement in the storage, and then the sync client can discover the, the changes. A very distinct feature of this system is that people have users can have direct access via file system or via the native protocol for physics applications. Okay, so this works. This synchronization works also if you modify files, mounting this as a file system. So this is for the data and metadata traffic so for synchronization. On uh, all the browser traffic, we, we direct to the web server. So, so far, so good. But as you could see, the users are really pushing us all the time. And actually, users expect functionality and the reliability of Dropbox. And since they understand that the system is deployed locally, they also expect the efficiency of the local file systems and lo local networks. Um, here is also an interesting point because you know we have a lot of users on on the site, but the way the uh, physics community is structured, actually these people travel a lot, and men a lot of times their home institutes are somewhere else, and they st so we have this really this case where people are going and staying com coming for three months to CERN and then coming for another three months I don't know back to US and so on. So this concept of a local <laughs> local service is a little bit blurred here because people have multiple homes in reality. Anyway, so in order to, to, to somehow cope with this, we have to really understand and prepare for protocol evolution and uh, anticipate some optimizations for ad and some advanced features. So we've heard some work done by Piotr earlier today about new chunking protocol from on cloud and the optimizations, HTTP2 and so on, and so on. And uh, maybe also possibly for some special use cases, uh, we may even think of, of, of having a, 
um, uh, of plugging in some other protocols for, for, for the future, or maybe special use cases. And we also heard these interesting things about the infinite and the C drive, this kind of different uh, concepts uh, for different ways of interacting. And as I mentioned, people have multiple home, uh, homes, and there's lots of the offline work case is kind of important in our community, and current protocol implementation is really la latency sensitive. So this is, this is one of the improvement points. So for the, let's say, the way we would like to evolve, evolve this architecture, so here nothing changes, however, um, uh, what we would like to do, we would really like to extract this kind of um, protocols endpoint into a set of smaller services, you can call them microservices if you want, and then talk to, the na to, the, to our storage via the native protocol. So currently we do not have a problem with the, the, the current scheme, however there are certain limitations, because if in this picture end-to-end -end is HTTP, HTTP has some kind of limitations of, for example, how many times you can retry the request and so on. And Put semantics are different from get semantics. You cannot easily retry puts and stuff like this. So if we are talking to our storage via the native protocol, then we have all possible tooling and all possible functionalities, for example, to call request and so on. And at the service management level, this is also this also means that we can deploy new versions of the protocols or we can test new stuff, new features more easily because we can deploy these microservices in more agile fashion. Um, yeah, so if we come to sharing, so you know, sharing in the on-premise storage clouds, the basic idea is that sharing is made very easy and it's a kind of quite a successful model because users are presented with a fairly simple uh, interface to share. And for majority of users, not all this is simple enough. Um, then actually it's a successful model because you know in, 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 in Sandbox currently we have around 25,000 shares and the last time we counted it was over 100 cent groups sharing and the, share, then the staff being shared to over 320 external institutes. So the sharing architecture works like this. The, the, the sync clients or any other clients, they use REST API that goes to the web server, there's a sharing app, and then this sharing app keeps track of the shares in the MySQL database in a table. Okay, here we do not have particular scaling problems because this is just tens of thousands of records. This is really very small. However, the distinct feature here is that at the same time, we also set the ACLs on the storage. So if I share something with you, uh, I will effectively, what will happen is that in my storage namespace, also the ACLs will be set accordingly. This is important because then this other person can access these files directly. <laughs> the drawback of current, our current approach is that it requires multiple sync folders. Because as you can see here, we're just storing the ACLs, but we are, we are not the storage does not have any idea about the shares themselves. So if, you want, if something is shared with you, you have to add another sync folder. This does not scale very well because, you know, if you have 50 shared folders or something like that, this list becomes really long. And really for a lot of users, this is too steep as, a, as, a, as, a, as an interface. So the way we would like to improve that is that actually we, again, we will put a small service, uh, small sharing service here, again, accessible via the REST API. However, we will store on the storage not only the ACLs, but also the information about the shares themselves, okay? So you can think of this as a kind of symbolic links if you want. This is actually a very similar idea to what uh, was presented for Dcash. Now what I mean is that um, um, if, um, if uh, John shares something to Kuba, it not only sets the ACLs, but also in my namespace, these shared folders start appearing, okay? This means that I can have direct file access to it, I can have access from Swan, for example, and this, is a, and this can be automatically synchronized. Of course, here you, have your, you immediately see that there are two very interesting challenges. One challenge is that the update notification currently is just limited to, to the home directory, okay? So we are not having a hotspot between multiple users. This entire update, uh, update, uh, update propagation of uh, notification or changes is actually rooted at the home directory of an individual person. 
Here, if you start creating this kind of crosslinks, then you all, all of a sudden may end up with a very complicated systems where you, have start, you start having update dependencies across the entire namespace. So this is something that needs to be handled slightly differently than we, than we do now. Um, yes, and uh, uh, so this is, the, this is the first problem with this. Uh, and this, is, this becomes even worse if you consider that uh, uh, this uh, functionality is enabled for groups. We have 30,000 groups, <laughs> LDAP groups at CERN, and some of them, the biggest ones, are, have 10,000 members. So you cannot really start creating this kind of dependency in, in this namespace in this way. So we have to put something in, in the middle, okay, and do this propagation in a slightly more relaxed way. Otherwise, it would not it would not work. Then there are also some uh, interesting corner cases. Um, uh, so the basic sharing works like I said, just setting the ACL. If you share it with someone, you can share a subfolder with somebody else. So we just get these nodes flavored, these directories, no problem. But then since we also expose this as a file system, you start having interesting side effects when, for example, stuff is moved around, okay? So somebody just uh, logs into a central service where this uh, file namespace is mounted as a Linux file system, and then they just move a share from one place to another. Okay, this is still a, an okay case because we keep track of what we've shared, and actually nothing, nothing really changes except that uh, the, file, the, the file path changes. But these changes become much, but these kind of um, uh, changes become much more hairy. Oh, sorry, this is also some PDF problem. Uh, actually, what should happen if you move a node from here to an unshared space, okay? So should you, should you remove this ACL or should you keep it like it was? So these are kind of, um, there are two competing strategies how to handle such cases because from one point of view, you know, people using a sync client, for them this is a pretty flat ACL. They just see the files, local files in their laptop. But actually behind the scenes on the server in the multi-user mode, this maps to multiple ACLs. So there's a bit of a challenge there. And then, you know, well, of course, we also do the study of what happens in uh, some other corner cases, and there are pretty many other corner cases for this. So, new functionality in service integration. Uh, uh, about the web apps and office workflows and collaborative editing. So, we have this nice web server here that allows us to plug in different apps. Uh, we do not have as many apps enabled currently as we would like. So we are working on that. Uh, what we are also working on is integrating this with the collaborative editing capability uh, from our Microsoft um, people that are running Microsoft products at CERN. So essentially, um, this, uh, this is a Microsoft uh, server from Office Online, Office, Office 365, and it exposes an HTTP um, HTTP interface, which is called WAPI, okay? And then you can use this, and this can do, uh, this can render the documents, and this can also provide uh, an environment where people online can edit their PowerPoints and, 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 their, and their Word documents. The good thing about it is that we do not run this service. This is very good, so somebody else runs it for us. And also that this backend is shared between also other services so people have a completely uniform experience. Okay, and uh, for web apps and scientific computing, you've heard of Swan before. So we have apps to render notebooks, we have apps to render analysis files, you have, for example, here is a demo. So people get this kind of stuff in the web interface, and we also, people can open the notebooks directly to the Swan services. Again, this is an external service to ours, but this, it's based on an interesting principle because it accesses directly the, the same files through the file system access. I think I'm running out of time, but I organized this conference, so I'll take two minutes more, okay? <laughs> so, federated sharing. Uh, okay, so this will be an interesting subject for, for Wednesday, but obviously, I, and here I do not have a very, very clear concept how we're gonna enable the federated sharing capability in our system. If we just enable it at, this, uh, at the level of the web server, okay, this is, this is kind of easy. But I'm not sure how much we want to integrate that with our storage because that could be 
a very interesting uh, uh, thing to operate. And finally, just last, not, not last but not least, so everything I've been talking about is for our EOS instance that is holding the general purpose home directories, if you want. But in the same system, using the same technology, we also have instances that are keeping physics data. So sandbox as such for the general purpose stuff, this is around, let's say, in the ballpark of one petabyte. Here we have a ballpark of 100 petabytes. And um, we have a capability to synchronize files on these instances too. And I believe there's at least one LHC experiment that uses it already. So this is not, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a reality. So this is also something to, uh, for the future to, to get more use of that. So just to summarize, Sandbox is in full expansion and very active development. It's really challenged, we are really challenged by the growing demands from our community. We have really excellent collaboration with many of you guys and, uh, and software providers as well. So thank you very much for that. And uh, really looking forward to discussing ideas and uh, working on implementations and breaking the stuff left and right to make it better. Thank you. We've got room for minus two questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Questions? Yes, sir. We do not sell it. <laughs> oh, oh, hard negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all open source. So uh, essentially, this you know, this is what we are trying to provide to our users, and uh, we are not. Uh, if you are interested in contributing to this development and also working with us, but also with others, like you know, we do a lot of work with OnCloud to optimize their stuff as well. Yeah. Any further questions? Could you repeat the question? Could I replace EOS with some other backend? Just for the sandbox part or for the LHC data handling part? <laughs> Theor yeah, well, theoretically, yes, but uh, you would really have to really, really, you would really have to think how to how you notify of, on the updates on the on the storage because this is this is really the crucial bit. So from let's say from the architecture point of view, there is no problem. There's just a problem for how efficiently you're able to implement similar mechanism on top of your other storage. And you need a very fast namespace. Yes, and you need a pretty fast namespace. No further questions? <laughs> oh, that's it, minus two. So in the, there are two kinds of changes that affect us, changes of the synchronization protocol. And here we are having a process with OnCloud, a process in the sense of design process. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to make sure that this, these things are, let's say, versioned and controlled. For the, for the, for the web server part, uh, Frankly speaking, like a status a year ago, it's, we had a lot of patches, but we, th since then we've been doing a lot of effort just to push anything that, anything that could be pushed upstream was pushed upstream, and essentially all the functionalities that we need can be encapsulated in plugins. So this is, this is, this is our idea. So then, uh, in the long run, unless OnCloud breaks their internal in APIs for the, for the apps, we are good. Yes, yes. So in this picture, okay, you will hear uh, many more interesting details about EOS tomorrow, but here essentially you have the namespace nodes here and here you have the storage nodes. These are the physical boxes uh, with, uh, I don't know, uh, 24 disks attached each. And actually this is heavily based on redirects. 
So essentially, the, the storage, the, the namespace node will keep track of how the storage is used and distributed, and files are distributed across the, the storage nodes, and will essentially redirect you to the storage nodes, which are currently free according to some placement groups and other criteria. So in, the, in, the, in a way, it's very similar, like you have policies in the object stores, except that this works on the, at the file level. I'm going to have to limit it at that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you.